What if I told you that a forgotten ship, once critical to America's economy and wartime efforts, now lies completely abandoned in the waters of the port of Chicago? This is CTC number one, Chicago's ghost ship. It's a relic of the Great Lakes industrial golden age, but now it's forgotten. For decades, this ship carried essential cargo across the Great Lakes, its decks loaded with iron, grain, and coal, but today it sits idle. So how did this happen? How did this mighty freighter go from a workhorse of the Midwest's economy to a decaying husk? And what does its story reveal about the rise and challenges faced by Chicago's port today? Stay tuned to find out as we uncover the story of Chicago's forgotten ghost ship. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. We've all made the mistake of offering up our personal information to the wrong online shop. And the next thing you know, the spam just starts flooding in. I've also done it. And basically what happened here is that your information was sold to data brokers. But with the correct awareness and some simple steps, you now have the power to remove your personal data that is exposed online. Delete Me is a fantastic service that will erase your personal data from people search websites. I'm talking about hundreds of data brokers selling your information. And it's an ongoing process. Once they clean house, they'll keep scanning for new data that shows up so they can remove that also. Thanks to Delete Me, I could remove old listings containing my vital records like former addresses, professional background, and even family photos. So that's all to say that with Delete Me's ongoing monitoring, I feel confident that I can continue enjoying the privacy everyone deserves. I'd encourage you to do the same. According to the Guardian article I recently read, just one click on the wrong junk mail can lead to a full-on deluge, resulting in piles of unwanted mail, some of which might even look legitimate. So if you want to get your personal information removed from search results on the web, go to joindeleteme.com slash SoCash. Delete Me is offering 20% off their privacy plans to all my viewers with code SoCash. Again, that's joindeleteme.com slash SoCash, promo code SoCash. To understand why the Windy City has a ghost ship, we need to go back to the mid 1800s when Chicago was a city in motion. As America pushed westward, Chicago's strategic location at the crossroads of rail and waterways positioned it perfectly for growth. The Port of Chicago became a critical link between the rich resources of the Midwest and the expanding markets of the East Coast, making the city one of America's most important industrial and trade hubs. As early as 1833, Chicago's population exploded from a few hundred to nearly 4,000 within a decade. The city's early industries revolved around agriculture, but this would change with a wave of infrastructure that transformed the area into a manufacturing and transport epicenter. The Illinois and Michigan Canal, completed in 1848, was a major factor. This canal linked Lake Michigan to the Illinois River and by extension, the Mississippi River, connecting the Great Lakes with the Gulf of Mexico and creating a continuous trade route from the Midwest to the rest of the world. The canal's completion made Chicago a critical access point allowing goods to travel from New Orleans to New York, with Chicago right in the middle. With the canal in place, Chicago's industries boomed, and the city's population swelled from just over 29,000 in 1850 to more than 300,000 in 1870. By this time, Chicago's stockyards, factories, and grain elevators were bustling with activity, turning the city into the gateway to the West. The port's impact on local industries was profound. But to elaborate a little bit, innovations such as grain elevators allowed Chicago to process massive amounts of grain, transforming the city into America's grain market leader and spawning the Chicago Board of Trade. This standardized the grain trade, making it more reliable and transparent, cementing Chicago's importance in agriculture across the nation. Just to add a little emphasis here, in the 19th century, there were moments that the Port of Chicago was so busy that it handled more tonnage than the Port of New York. It was a scene of constant movement and opportunity, feeling a city that felt like it could achieve anything. Now, if we fast forward to World War II, the Port of Chicago enjoyed another significant turning point, benefiting the city itself. As the United States ramped up its war efforts, Chicago became an industrial powerhouse, 
dedicated to producing the machinery, vehicles, and raw materials needed to win the war. Factories across the city shifted from peacetime production to making tanks, ships, and planes. Plants like Republic Steel and Acme Steel along the Calumet River worked around the clock, producing the raw materials for material manufacturing. This boom led to another influx of workers from all over the country, many of whom stayed in Chicago long after the war ended. And it was in this context, with other major Great Lakes cities also on the rise, that major freighters were needed. The need for new ships that could navigate the Great Lakes inland waterways, but without transferring cargo to ocean-bound vessels, spurred new construction. The United States Maritime Commission ordered a fleet of Great Lake freighters to support the war effort, and among them was the CTC No. 1, originally launched as the McIntyre in 1943. Built at the Great Lakes Engineering Works in Michigan, this so-called Laker was designed specifically for Great Lakes conditions, with a length of 620 feet and a reinforced hull that could withstand Lake Michigan's famously harsh weather. The CTC No. 1 could carry up to 15,800 tons of iron, coal, or other vital resources, making it an indispensable asset for the wartime effort. But it wasn't just a ship. It was a symbol of industrial might and a critical link in the wartime supply chain. Chicago steel mills and factories were kept busy, thanks partly to the steady flow of resources transported by ships like the CTC No. 1. After the war, however, the demand for these specialized freighters began to wane as America's economy shifted from military production to consumer goods. The years following World War II were marked by economic change, changes that were not exactly favorable to old-fashioned logistics. Chicago's manufacturing landscape began to decline, a shift that would have lasting impacts on the port and ships like CTC No. 1. While the city continued to lead in manufacturing throughout the 1950s, changes in global trade and industry began to erode this dominance. The rise of suburban factories, advances in technology, and increasing competition from abroad led to a steady loss of manufacturing jobs. By the 1970s, the city's industrial sector was a shadow of its former self. Urban renewal programs aimed to stem the tide, but many were too little, too late. Projects to modernize factories and attract new businesses could not prevent the closure of over 450 companies between 1955 and 1960 alone. Then, the completion of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959 dealt yet another blow. By linking the Great Lakes directly to the Atlantic, the seaway allowed larger ocean-going vessels to bypass Chicago, undercutting the need for smaller Great Lakes freighters like the CTC No. 1. As industries closed and trades shifted, the Port of Chicago and its fleet of Lakers found themselves in an increasingly irrelevant role. With that in mind, as the Port of Chicago struggled to adapt, the CTC No. 1 also had to find a new purpose. In 1979, the ship was retired from active service on the Great Lakes. Two years later, it was sold to the Medusa Portland Cement Company and converted into a stationary barge to store and transfer cement. Modifications made in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin transformed it from a mighty freighter to a floating warehouse permanently moored at Lake Calumet in Chicago. For nearly three decades, the CTC No. 1 served as a storage barge, and in that time, it was a silent witness to the city's continued industrial decline. However, if we fast forward to 2009, even this function was deemed unnecessary, and the ship was just left to decay, a floating relic in a forgotten port. Today, the ship is a rusty shell, its once powered engine stripped of vital parts, its hull covered in rust and debris. The decline of the Port of Chicago mirrored the city's industrial struggles. By the 1980s, most of the port's facilities were outdated and underused. A 1987 report highlighted numerous issues, from sunken docks to disheveled warehouses. The report also covered the management failures that led to this neglect and despair. Today, the CTC No. 1 remains docked, a ghost ship symbolizing the forgotten promise of Chicago's industrial power. The ship's future remains uncertain. Efforts have been made to scrap it, but high cost and environmental hazards makes even this challenging. In other words, 
For now at least, it remains a floating memory of Chicago's industrial legacy. The port of Chicago may be down, but it's not out. Recently, there's been renewed interest in reviving the area and adapting it for 21st century needs. For example, in 2023, a federal grant of $144 million was allocated to rehabilitate four historic bridges over the Calumet River. These bridges, which are raised thousands of times a year, are crucial for allowing ships to pass through, and their renovation is essential for any future port activity. Beyond bridge repairs, port officials are also exploring ways to expand and diversify. One proposal includes using the port as a hub for offshore wind energy components, positioning Chicago as a renewable energy leader. However, revitalizing the port would require substantial investment and commitment, and there's no guarantee for success, nor does there seem to be much mention of the city's ghost ship. In conclusion, I'd say that from its heyday as a wartime freighter to its final years as a stationary barge, this ship reflects the shifting fortunes of a city once synonymous with American industry. As we look to the future, this ghost ship's fate may change. And perhaps the bigger question is, will Chicago reclaim its place as an industrial powerhouse, or will the CTC number one remain a relic of a bygone era? I suppose only time will tell. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn about another Chicago secret, don't miss our episode on the forgotten Illinois-Indiana State Boundary Monument by clicking right here. And help us cross that 700,000 subscriber mark by clicking the subscribe button. Otherwise, until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.